Wendy Wood, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Oh, I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I've got so many pages of notes on your book, called, which is called Good Habits, Bad Habits. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the only thing I really find fault with is that you, you don't realize that there is a correct way to put the toilet paper in the roll. You, <laughs> you, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where you got that from, but we're, we're going to clear that up before the hour is done. <laughs> Um, but we, we all have many habits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't like this relativism <laughs> track. Here. Um, anyway, this is a fantastic book. And what I love about it is the uh, the subtitle which goes above is the science of making positive changes that stick. I have a bookshelf that has maybe a dozen books on habit at this point. And you're really the person who said, like, is this true? Is that true? Like, this all sounds good. Every time I read one of those books, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. That sounds good. And you're actually putting things to the test. So I'd, I'd love to just start with I'd like to do to talk to academics as if they're human beings sometimes. And like what like what's the evolution of your own interest in habits and how you decided to go about studying them? That's a good question. I, um, I actually didn't set out to study habits. I set out to study how people stick with behavior changes. We all are very good at making decisions to change and starting our journey to a healthier, happier life. Um, we know many of the things that we should be doing to ensure those things. And what I was interested in is why we're so good at the beginning parts of it when we're mm -hmm. starting out making those decisions and initially sticking with them, but then not always able to maintain them. And, and it's actually become sort of an institution, right? New Year's mm -hmm. resolutions. We expect almost to fail because so many of us do so much of the time. And what is that? Why is it that we're not as successful at sticking with things as we are at making the initial decision? So that's how I started looking into this question to try to understand persistence. And it became clear early on that the way people persist naturally is they form habits. And they form habits that allow them to do behaviors automatically so that it becomes sort of almost second nature to people as they are um, repeating the behavior over and over. And as a psychologist, then I wanted to know, well, so what are habits? And how do they function? And how can we define them and represent them and change them? So that's sort of the, that's the progression of my interest in this area and how I came to write the book. And as you say, there are many books on habits out there um, by people who are very smart and do interesting things, but habits are not something that you can intuit. Something I learned early, <clears throat> early on is that habits are really part of the unconscious. So they're part of our minds that we don't have access to. They function outside of awareness. And there's good reason for that, and we can talk about that mm -hmm. if you want to. But, but they're not something that you can understand by observing yourself or observing other people. They don't have the same logic as our conscious thinking selves. Right. And well, which, which led me to like this, this like delicious paradox, which is like you talk about and this game, I guess, comes from, you know, behavioral science research that human beings, we really overestimate how much our conscious selves are in control, our deliberate, intentional selves that want things in the world are actually running the show. So there's this tremendous sort of overinflation of our own, the importance of our minds. 
which, you know, in the work I do, helping people be live healthy lives translates almost instantly into self-loathing because they feel like I'm, you know, I'm so in charge. It's almost like what I remember as a little kid, like going to a video arcade or like a game room and the game I hadn't put a quarter in, but like things were still playing and I was like pretending to drive or, or do the joystick, but I actually wasn't accessing it. It's almost like people have like they're trying to access things, but they haven't put the quarter in. And so they go from this over um, evaluation of their own uh, mind's importance to being really hard on themselves. And that's a great analogy because it, habits run off even when we are thinking about something else and doing something else. So your analogy of the um, my, my kids used to do this, too. They would love to go sit in the um, in the video arcade just to pretend that they were playing. Nothing was really happening because, as you say, they hadn't put the money in. Um, the the um, pictures and stuff were sort of running off on their own. And in a way, that's a that is a, a nice metaphor for what happens with our own experience. We can only know what we know, and that's our conscious thinking selves. Mm -hmm. And it does so much, but it doesn't do everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that people miss. So they think they can make decisions and change their habits in the same way that they can make decisions and change their beliefs or change their perceptions of something. It habits don't work that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like, um, yeah, it's like cha you know, changing perceptions. Like I have, I know people in my life who tell me that they can see auras and that anyone can see an aura. It's like, well, it doesn't matter how hard I will myself to see auras. It's not happening. And maybe there's some protocol that would allow me to do it or something. But just to say like, OK, I'm from now on, I'm going to eat healthy. Right. Bec becomes this thing where you're you're trying to get the arcade game to do something mm -hmm. that it's not going to do by itself. It's almost it's almost like this. I guess, you know, it's like um, Danny Kahneman's system one and system two, where one of the one of the features, not a bug of the non deliberative system is that it's running without your control. Exactly. And habits are set up that way. You can see the evolutionary benefits of an, having a memory system that doesn't change easily, right? That is very slow to form and very slow to shift. Even though you might want to do something different, there's some information that's important enough, that's been repeated often enough, so that it should be stored in a way that you can't lose it easily. Mm. And, and that's how to eat and stay alive. That's how to sleep and, and get yourself rested, how to exercise. These are things we repeat on a regular basis. And they're important enough for our survival that we store them in a way that takes a while to learn, a lot of repetitions. And then also, takes a long time to change because you can't mess with it easily. As you say, that's a feature. It's not a bug. Mm. Yeah. And because because it's so like I can't imagine a species that would have evolved and been successful without this. Right. Like, oh, every day I get a, I have to make a decision. Do I eat or do I not eat? Do I <laughs> work or not work? Like there's too many there's too many variables and too many places for that to go wrong without this sort of bat like a gyroscope, a survival mm -hmm. gyroscope that keeps us going no matter how insane our, our flights of fancy might be. Exactly. That would make us follow the patterns that we've learned in the past about how to get food and about how to, to um, interact with other people and all of the important things that you do on a repeated basis every day. It's just 
it's too important to leave to something as fluid and flexible as our conscious thinking sounds. Hmm. So let's let's get to your your quest to understand habits, which I guess begins with a, with a definition. Right. So what, what is your definition of a habit and how does that definition help us? The definition that um, that I use and most psychologists at this point use is that habits are representations, they're cognitive representations that come to mind automatically when you're in the context where you repeated a behavior in the past. So I get up in the morning, I walk into my kitchen, I stand in front of my coffee maker, and I'm not asking myself, do I want coffee? If I want coffee, do I want a cappuccino? Do I want espresso? Do I want plain coffee? I stand in front of my coffee maker, and I'm fuzzy in the morning, so I'm not thinking a lot. And what comes to mind is the steps. You do this, you do this, you do this to make coffee, and I just do it. I follow those steps. It's amazingly efficient. I don't have to wonder, and I don't even have to ask myself, do I want this? I just make the coffee. Mm. And it's easy to see that with um, some behaviors, like making coffee. It's not quite so easy to see it when we are struggling. Say we've made made a decision, we're going to change our behavior. Mm -hmm. Maybe we've decided we don't want to drink coffee anymore. So then we walk into the kitchen and making coffee comes to mind. And we think, oh geez, I guess I really want a cup of coffee. But what people don't realize, this is sort of our conscious self interpreting what's going on with our habit system. Our habit system just brought coffee to mind because that's what we typically do. It's not because we necessarily want it. Mm. It's just there. Right. So it's, it's like it's, it's, it's become an equilibrium, right? Like sort of like the, um, you know, the valley where the, the ball comes to rest. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think you know, so you've also said like it's a it's a solution. It's a, like a time tested solution to a problem. And like our, the context is, OK, here's the problem in the you know, I have to do something in the morning. <laughs> I have to do something. And coffee is like, look, this has worked a lot in the past. So let's mm -hmm. just let's just keep doing that. Exactly. And because that particular solution comes to mind, we tend to assume that must be what we want. And it's how I think we get into this struggle with ourselves of assuming, wow, I must really want coffee. So this is going to be a really hard thing for me to break. And that leads to the misinterpretations that we have about our habits. Mm -hmm. So when when you um, started thinking about this from a, you know, systems one, systems two perspective. What were some of the early experiments that you wanted to run to understand this in a more fundamental or, or, or granular way? Well, we've done I've, I've done about 30 years of research on this <laughs> at this point. Um, so there's many different aspects of habit that we've investigated. Um, I can tell you about how to form a good habit, I, but I think the biggest challenge that people have is in changing unwanted habits. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're going to, that, that's particularly what an audience like yours is going to be concerned about with the upcoming new year. Right, right. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some of my my notes here. Um, and like one thing that really struck me is you say pretty early in the book that habits are relatively insensitive to rewards. So like that first cup of coffee, you know, probably was gross, right? It was uh, 
too bitter and weird tasting, but other people were doing it. And then you did it a few times and then now you're a coffee drinker and now you can't get a, you can't get through the day without your caffeine and it's become a habit. But like you're because the conscious mind is, is not in the conversation, the habit mind doesn't say, am I getting benefit from this? The habit mind is just plowing ahead blinders on. And so like but people but people often say, well, I get a reward from this, right? Like I get a reward from the coffee. I get a reward from big dopamine reward from eating sugar or fatty foods. Right. But it's not exactly it's not the way they mean that they say they mean it. They think like, oh, I eat this and I'm really happy or I drink this and I have all my energy. There's some there's some other kind of reward like you call it the, like the ghosts of old rewards. Exactly. Yes. And one of the studies we did to demonstrate this was in a local movie theater. We had people come in and watch movie trailers. They thought the purpose of the study was to um, watch the trailers and tell us which ones they liked. In actuality, we gave them boxes of popcorn. Some got stale popcorn, a box of stale, and it was very stale. We popped it a week earlier and kept it in our lab in a plastic bag for a week. <laughs> and others got fresh popcorn. And then we asked these people at the end of the movie trailers whether they usually whether they usually ate popcorn while they watched movies. And the people who didn't typically eat popcorn at the movie theater acted just the way you'd expect them to, right? We think people eat popcorn because it's salty, it's fatty, it sort of tastes good. And so they ate the popcorn that tasted that way. They ate the fresh popcorn. They didn't eat the stale popcorn. But people who had habits to eat popcorn in the movie theater, they could tell us that the stale popcorn really wasn't good. It was bad, but they ate it anyway. And it's because they were in the context that they were normally in when they ate popcorn. And that idea of eating popcorn just kept, kept coming to mind, even though it really wasn't reinforcing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a positive experience. It gives you an idea of how resistant our habits once we formed them, how resistant they are to change. That even when the outcome is not what we want, when coffee tastes bad, when we really don't need that kick because we're already a little anxious and aroused, mm -hmm. or um, uh, any, any setting that would make it so that the practiced behavior, the one that got rewarded in the past, isn't rewarding now doesn't make any difference. That idea still comes to mind and we still act on it. Mm. And you, you, have, you shared a lot of research that I was not familiar with around sort of the the physiology of dopamine and the salience and the fact that how, you know, like if you do something, if I if I eat the apple instead of the candy bar and two hours later or two weeks later or two months later or two years later, I'm happy I did cumulatively that that's completely insensitive to habit formation. That's what happens in the minute or so right after. And that dopamine somehow like hijacks our attention so that the things that we're used to doing become more salient in our environment like that, uh, the Magritte. Uh, painting that you, you list in the book where the like the comb is the size of the bed, right? The, they could be in the movie theater, but the mental representation of this bucket of stale popcorn, it could be bigger than the screen in their mind. Exactly. So they, it's whatever we have experience with um, that has given us rewards in the past is what we notice now. And you're absolutely right for habit formation. Rewards matter a lot. So this is, this is a tricky thing about habits. And I think a lot of people get confused because rewards are important for forming habits. As you say, the reward has to be in the moment. So it's not enough 
to buy yourself some fancy thing at the end of the week if you stick to your diet or give yourself a present if you go to the gym as often as you want. It has to be in the moment when you're doing it. You have to be getting some enjoyment from the experience in order to form a habit. But once that habit is formed, it is insensitive to rewards in general, meaning the rewards can shift. The popcorn can become stale. The behavior can no longer be really working for you. It can be something you don't really want to do. And yet still, the response comes to mind and you act, most of us, just act on the responses in mind because it's easier. Mm -hmm. And so, but then what, what do we do about the fact that so it's insensitive to rewards? And you, you talk about, you know, the whole, the whole chapter about rewards, about cre creating alternative habits that you reward yourself for in the moment. But like for, for people that I work with, there's nothing more rewarding than a chocolate bar or a pepperoni pizza. Right. Like you'd, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to give them like crack cocaine, to be, <laughs> right? which, which is not the direction we want to go with our clients. Exactly. <laughs> Completely understood. <laughs> um, the um, the issue with changing with changing old habits is that rewards are not going to be very useful in that. Simply because, as we've said, habit memories shift very slowly. So you're rewarding people for one behavior, but the other one keeps coming to mind because that's their habit. And it's exhausting to keep telling yourself, no, don't eat that chocolate. I should be eating the good thing that my coach, my advisor, my health counselor has told me I should be eating. It, it's exhausting. Few of us can do that. And that's why um, there's a couple of tricks to changing unwanted habits that don't actually have to do with rewards. Okay. And, <laughs> and, well, <laughs> it's been great talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Now you read my book. <laughs> no, you've read it. You know it. Um, so one of them um, we all know, which is the anti-smoking campaigns in the U.S. were one of the most absolutely successful health interventions ever. Mm. And what they did is they put friction on smoking. So... They started taxing smoking. They took cigarettes off store shelves. So you actually have to ask someone in order to get to buy a cigarette. They, um, the, the government banned smoking in many public places. So it's just much more difficult. We can't light up in the office anymore. We used to be able to smoke in airplanes, believe it or not, but, but you can't do that anymore. So anti-smoking campaigns did what knowledge of cancer was unable to do. We knew long before these campaigns that smoking caused cancer, but people kept smoking because they had the habit. It was cued by everything around them. So one of the things to control an unwanted behavior is to put friction on it, to make it more difficult. Mm. One of the simplest ways of putting friction on something is proximity. Make it further away. Mm -hmm. And one of the studies I love um, is has to do with going to a paid fitness center or gym. A data analytics company, this is not my research, a data analytics company tracked cell phones for several months, tracked thousands of cell phones to see how far people, 
holding the cell phones, were willing to go to a, a, their local gym. And what they found is that if you are going about three and a half miles to your local gym, you'll go five times a month on average. If you go 5.1 miles, you only go once a month. So that small distance, it's a little over a mile, is the distance between having a fitness habit and and not. Right. And that's still, that's still a mile. And by, and by the way, I, I joined a gym two weeks ago, which is nine miles away. So I was really sad to read that. But, uh, <laughs> but, but there's no traffic well, lights. <laughs> and if it is close to your work or close to your grocery store, some uh -huh. other way to integrate it into your lifestyle, then that's you will probably hmm. go just as often as if it was next door. Well, that, that's, the, that's funny because what I ended up doing was like driving around. There's a little shopping mall there and I'm like, oh, I could shop there. And oh, there's a there's another dump. I don't have to. I can go to that dump and take make one trip. And oh, there's a post office in the 7-Eleven. <laughs> there you go. You have made it convenient for yourself. So you are reducing the friction because proximity reduces friction and what's close to us we're more likely to do mm. so that's that's one that that's one really important insight right. and there was there was another study i'm not um remembering but it was about popcorns and apples there was a proximity of like six feet and not a mile exactly yes this was an experiment where some people had a bowl of apple slices in front of them and a um, bowl of popcorn way at the end of the table. They could see it, they could smell it, and they could reach it if they just sort of lunge slightly. Um, or they had the popcorn in right in front of them and the apples at a slight distance. If you have the apples in front of you, you eat one third the calories as if you have the popcorn in front of you. You can see them both. You can reach them both. But that simple proximity meant you were eating three times more if the popcorn is close by. And, and that's something that, again, these are things that seem really simple to our conscious minds, and we think, well, if I'm on a diet, I'm gonna, I'm eating healthfully. I'm gonna eat the apples no matter where they are. But it doesn't work that way, because proximity is friction, and our habits, our behaviors that we repeat over and over, are very responsive to proximity. Okay. So, I, but I want to challenge that a little bit from my own experience and in talking to, with some of my clients who are like, OK, I'm going to cover up the TV after nine o'clock. I'm going to put a sheet over it or I'm going to put the cookies in the top shelf or I'm going to, you know, almost to the point. Like, those are all. Yes, right? those are all ways to control. <laughs> so a bunch of years ago, I read this book called Your Money or Your Life. And it was about like saving money and not buying useless shit and stuff like that. And one of their suggestions was like you could actually go and print it out on your printer and fold it and tape it and create a, a credit card condom. And it's and it had like all these inspirational sayings on it. It was like, you know, it was like a little little envelope for your credit card. And you had to get it out and look at it and I got really good at getting the credit card in and out of that envelope. And I hear from people like, yeah, I do. I do this. And then when I want the thing, I just go do it anyway. Like the, the friction, it, it, it almost feels like friction would be good if it was like, you know, like a pen balancing. And but it doesn't like if 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 the, the habit is so ingrained and it feels like, God, I really want that Lara bar. And yeah, it's in the trunk of the car. <laughs> But I'm going to go get it anyway. <laughs> like, so how can you help people, you know, where where friction doesn't seem to to do the trick? Um, there. Well, let me say first that 
friction works on average. It doesn't work in all circumstances, as you're pointing out. These are suggestions for people that work better than the standard, I'm just going to white knuckle through it and make it work. Mm. Friction is one step, mm. and it does reduce the amount of junk people eat, the amount that they spend. Obviously, it works because it is, I mean, much of our economy is based on it, right? The whole idea that if you don't have to, the two clicks is too much <laughs> to get people to buy stuff, that you have to reduce it to a single click, or even just face recognition on your phone to buy something. Anything you can do to make something easier, reduce the friction, mm. will make it more likely that people do it. Anything that increases the friction will make it less likely. Doesn't mean it's impossible, as you're pointing out, but it just makes it less likely. Mm -hmm. the, other, yeah. the other thing is that, that I recommend to people if they want to change a bad habit, is um, changing the context in which you typically do the behavior. And there's great data suggesting that when people move, or um, I've done some of this work myself, when they're in new settings, new contexts, you have to make decisions. Hmm. The old habit is no longer activated. And so you are free then to say, okay, I'm not going to eat candy bars anymore at three o'clock in the afternoon, like I did at my old job. I'm going to find something else to do. And that's much easier when you're not in the same context as before, because the context isn't bringing to mind that behavior that... <laughs> you no longer want. Mm. So I'm going to ask you about something that happened to me about six well, was April, whatever, however many months ago that was. So uh, you you all you, you know, Peter Bregman, who mm -hmm. um, was you were on his podcast um, a month ago or so. So yeah, he, he's he, like he is. He is. He was leading a, a workshop at Esalen and I was assisting him and at the end of the last day, he's like, hey, do you want to, you know, everyone's gone. We're like, oh, like, let's go down to this beautiful hut and meditate for 20 minutes. I'm like, OK, that sounds like a good idea. And I've, I, I like I understand like why meditation is good. And I've sort of flirted with it with it for years. And I would try this style and then headspace and 10 percent happier. But nothing would stick. And we went to meditate for 20 minutes. And I said, that was really funny. He says, yeah, I've, I've, you know, I do it every morning, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. I just do that. And at that moment, I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. And something happened that I don't understand. But ever since then, I have done it like un, you know, unerringly, infallibly. And I just felt Good like at, at that moment, something like I couldn't have willed it. It's like you talk about trying to make yourself fall asleep or you know, trying to will yourself into a habit. But being in that space, having that conversation like I knew at that moment that I was going to do it. And I don't understand that. And I wonder if, if there's any, you know, context like can, can science explain that or was I just like graced? I, you know, I I don't I don't know enough about that specific experience to understand mm -hmm. why that was enough to change. Typically, the way people start to meditate or do something like that is as you're suggesting they find an app or they find um, some other class that they can use to practice but then you have to actually automate it it's not enough to make a decision i'm gonna meditate this morning i'm gonna meditate tomorrow night mm. on the weekend it, it's all too conscious and our conscious minds are really good at coming up with reasons why we shouldn't right <laughs> um, other things that we could be doing instead so 
you really want to automate it and do it in the same way each time. Mm. And it could be that it w- this was nothing more than a realization to you. I, mean, I, I really don't know enough, yeah. but I'm just speculating um, that this was a realization to you that it is possible to integrate it into your morning routine and your afternoon routine in ways that you maybe hadn't realized before mm. or practiced before. Mm. And it's that kind of routinization where it just sort of becomes a pattern in your day that is what makes uh. for successful meditators. Well, that's one thing he said was like, I just get out of bed and start meditating. It's the first thing I do in the morning. And so I'm like, okay, I'll I'll do that. I'll I'll do you one better. I won't even get out of bed. I'll just scooch. <laughs> I'll just scooch up on the pillows. And like the fir- <laughs> first thing I do in the morning. So that yeah. So so maybe I was attributing to uh, you know to angels and trumpets and 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 fairies. What you can, what can attribute to? I found a time and just did it every single day. Yes, and and my guess is that it's sort of like. I, I had a period in my life when I needed to exercise and wasn't, and I couldn't find any time to do it. I was struggling. I had little kids. They always had to go to the doctor. They had play dates. They were fun to be around, and I, I didn't really want to go off and exercise in the afternoon when I came home from work. I had spent enough time away from them. So, so it was very hard for me to actually get myself to do it. And after about a year of struggling and feeling really bad about myself, because I was much, I weighed much more than, than I needed to, um, I figured out that if I went out first thing in the morning, six in the morning, and I ran until breakfast time, so I was back home to have breakfast with my sons, that I could automate that. And it was horrible to begin with. Oh. It was really, it was, I mean, no one wants to get out of bed at six in the morning and go running. It, it took a real struggle, but after about a month, it just became the thing I did. I didn't even ask myself, do I want to this morning? It just was the thing, so, as your yeah. meditation is. Mm. So that's that speaks to one of the uh, the other tricks is uh, repetition. Exactly. <laughs> and, yes. and, this, and the studies you've done and the study you cite are so interesting and so almost counterintuitive that like you just do something enough and you start liking it. Not funny what people ask what our minds do, but there's very good data on this that once we have done things often enough, we we start to like them. There's, there's clear caveats to that too, right? If you really hate vegetables, all kinds of vegetables, there's no way you're going to start liking them just by, <laughs> just by eating more of them. It, it, these are things that might be um, neutral or might be things that you don't like all that much, but things you hate, it won't matter how often you do them. Uh, You're not going to learn to like them. But the things that we sort of don't know a whole lot about or um, maybe only sort of dislike, if we keep doing them, we do like them better. Yeah. Mm. Um, So, um, I mean, first, you do mention like the artichoke study where like, toddlers did start liking their artichokes I mean, it didn't mm-hmm. it didn't matter if they were sweetened or, or other, otherwise enhanced just repetition and familiarity led to it yes although there were some who did not learn to uh-huh. like artichokes no matter what happened uh-huh. yes there was about 10 percent that were <clears throat> so is that part i mean partly i was thinking of that in terms of self-esteem like when you do so, especially for behaviors you do something repetitive you know, so I'm getting up in the morning and doing this thing and I don't 
are my sneakers tight enough? And am I wearing reflective clothing? And how do I wear what side of the road do I like all this like new like what shoes like when you're new, everything is, uh, you know, is either like an exciting adventure or a hassle. But then once you start like, OK, this is a thing like somewhere your system one tells you, hey, you're good at this. It doesn't matter if it's 6 a.m. and you don't really like doing it and it's cold out or it's raining. It's like you get a like a hit of self-esteem from just repeating the action. Well, and that feeling of self-esteem helps to build habits. So in, in your example of running early in the morning, um, I learned that listening to the radio um, which is something I didn't have time to do most of the rest of the day. I used to listen to NPR and this was before podcasts. Um, it was very rewarding. Mm. It made me feel good. And I started taking my dog with me too. And she loved it. So the whole thing, I, I, I found ways to make it more appealing over time. And as you say, there is a certain pride that you get from um, doing the things that you struggled with in the past and have now figured out. And that also mm -hmm. generates dop that dopamine release, which helps to build habits. Yeah. Mm. So, um, so one of my questions about that is so th like the idea of some things that you just don't like to do like a lot of the habit research was like bundling, right? So you bundle some reward with it. So you have your NPR and um, other people will watch Netflix in the basement on the on the stationary bicycle. You have a lot of uh, research in the book about the the use and misuse of monetary rewards as you know, ex extrinsic versus like the intrinsic joy of doing something. But for a lot of stuff like getting up and running in the morning, there is no intrinsic joy at the beginning. But like one of the things I really work with a lot with with my clients on is um, our mutual friend Dan Ariely has this phrase benign masochism, which is like watching people at CrossFit or triathletes who are like celebrating how bad the workout sucked and how spent they are and how much they're hurting. And it, it, it feels like almost like because of future discounting that, OK, I'm going to be fit in a year or like and the pain is all now that specifically trying to do things that suck so that you feel good about yourself. Like, look at me doing this thing that sucks is actually a kind of reward in the moment. Yeah, perhaps there are probably people who are motivated by that. We all are motivated by different rewards. Uh -huh. um, so you don't think that's a universal? I, I have a son who is a, an avid bike rider and he over Thanksgiving, he got together with some of his friends here and they went up in the mountains and they went on an outrageous bike ride in the mountains and came home and they were sharing stories of how gassed they were. <laughs> <laughs> so and and they clearly love the bike riding experience. So it's not masochism in that sense. They love the things they get to see and the feeling of being free and fit and challenging themselves. There's so many things that they love about it. But yeah, they joke about it. Mm -hmm. It has pain too. I, mm -hmm. I, I think the habit builds from the positive experiences, the dopamine release, the yeah. other good bragging rights. Mm. <laughs> well, it's just I mean, I know people, you know, they're 300, 400 pounds and they have this self image. And the first day they walk around the block, they're like, I'm dragging. Everything hurts. And look mm. at me. I did a thing. Yeah, that's pride. Pride. Yes. It's it's pride and, and they should be proud. That's a wonderful thing. If you can it, it's really hard to exercise when you get a bit overweight. It's no fun. So pride and it is is a big 
big piece of habit mm. formation in that case. Yeah, mm. yeah, that's that's a great way of thinking of it. It's almost like the pride is in, is in magnitude in relation to how hard the thing was. Yeah, yeah, for some oh, yeah. that helps. Um, so the other thing I really wanted to talk to you about was stress, because I it's it was uh, reading about stress and how they affect habits was really obvious after your setup, but I had never thought about it that way. So we think about stress as being a disruptive force in our lives. And you argue that in many ways, it's the exact opposite. Can you talk about stress? And yes, we've done some work on this. Um, tracking people and their habits when they're in stressful situations and when they're not. So some of the work we've done has been with college students when they are taking exams, finals, and they're all stressed out. And when they're more calm and less stressed. And what we find is that when people are stressed, they fall back on their habits which doesn't sound surprising at all, right? Because we all think, okay, so when I get stressed, of course, I fall back on my bad eating habits, I fall back on my bad exercise, non-exercise habits, but that's only half of the story. We also fall back on our good habits. So if you have a strong exercise habit, you're more likely to do it when you're stressed. And the the... It's a, as you say, it's quite simple in some ways because if we're not thinking all that much and stress actually sort of derails our thinking conscious minds, it gives us, makes us sort of preoccupied with whatever is the thing we're worrying about, then we're not changing our behavior, we're sort of back to the default. We're not deciding, oh, instead of going to the salad bar today for lunch, which I always do, I'm gonna try this new restaurant. We don't have the energy for that. Right. When but, we're yeah, stressed. But, but people think, well, I'm stressed, so I'm just gonna get a Coke and a bag of Kit Kats. Like, th like that's how we think about it, but that's really an ingrained bad habit. That the. That, exactly. That our habit system doesn't think in terms of good or bad. It's just right. This is how we this is how we roll when we're not thinking about it. It's just the default. It's just the thing that gives us a response when we're not thinking and deliberating and trying to make decisions in the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And you talk about your um, I guess your research and others research on you know stress as something that leads people to exploit existing strategies rather than exploring new ones. Um, how does how does that tie into habits? Yeah, so there's this idea in managerial context, organizational context that um, companies can either exploit what what has worked in the past. Or they can explore and innovate. And there's good research that when you stress managers and decision makers, they are more likely to keep doing what the organization has done in the past. Just like we do as organisms, as individuals, broader companies do as well through the decisions made by managers and organizational leaders. Under stress, we don't have time to innovate and energy to innovate. So we repeat what we've done in the past. Sometimes that's OK. Sometimes it's good enough mm. in, in a rapidly changing economy with many new products, new innovations, new technology um, that probably doesn't work for you very well. <laughs> so that's that's um, that exploit past habits only works good enough. Mm. It won't give you the ideal, ideal mm. response. Right, because I'm also thinking, you know, um, do work a lot of work with people on their stress responses, 
And you know, I, I interviewed uh, Stephen Porges, who's written the polyvagal theory with this idea that for, for many of us, because of trauma or, or whatever, that our neurology is set up to interpret everything as stressful. So we're in this constant fight or flight. And I'm thinking for, for those people, like what this really brought up for me is that people who are in constant fight or flight or, or in fold, you know, like are continually exploiting the ghosts of past rewards. And that they're they're relying even more heavily on like this. I don't, it's not much, but it's all I got. Yeah, you, because you have to give a response. I mean, uh, when the, this and this is what the habit system is good at is it's good at recreating what worked in the past. It gives you a response when you're terrified because there's a bear coming at you. And that response that you've practiced to fear in the past is running away. If you just stood there paralyzed, it wouldn't be very functional. So habits are the good enough response. There might be a better response at the time, mm -hmm. right? but that's not the one you take. Right. And, and we don't really have to practice running away from the bear. Right. That's that's sort of ingrained. But we do have to practice not running away from the boss. Yes. Right. Or the, or the email or the car that cut us off in traffic. Exactly. Yes. Times when we need to actually be there and give a response. One that's just good enough is what the habit system gives us. All right. Mm -hmm. So you had um, I think on page 198, there was a phrase that I wrote down because I liked it so much is that um, <clears throat> this is related to addictions, but can be um, expanded, I think, to habits generally that success can often mean just moving to a non pathogenic environment mm -hmm. right? where you're like <clears throat> and you talk, you know, at length about the Vietnam returning soldiers who were addicted to heroin and all and the surprising results that most of them simply dropped their addictions as soon as they got home. And this idea that context is so critical to to our behaviors. And part of me as I was reading this was like, yeah, right on. And part of me was saying, doesn't this fragilize us that we're now so dependent on environments? And then you told a story in the book that made me say, aha, when you talked about getting your new car, with the backup sensor. And when you rented a car that didn't have it, you smacked your bumper. It's like, doesn't isn't there a danger of setting up environments that are too conducive to good habits that we then rely on them as opposed to on our, our own recognizance? I think it <clears throat> I think it's impossible for us to rely on our own best judgment. Our minds aren't set up that way. We think we should be able to. But it takes time to think through what to do to come up with the best solution. It takes energy. And if you had to do that every time you were presented with something to eat or every time you were presented with some distraction in your life, you would have no time left to do the important things. So we can't think through it's it's not possible for us to take that time and energy to think things through. We are reliant on our environments so much more than we realize. And, and this again is our conscious thinking self sort of taking a bit more credit than it should for our behavior because most of us don't realize that we are so dependent on our environment. So given that we are, it, it, and I don't think any psychologist would disagree with this, that consciousness is just not efficient and it's not something that we can rely on on a regular basis. Um, given that, we have to then use other strategies and our environment is influencing us all the time, whether we're aware of it or not. Mm. But let's but so. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a time uh, a few years ago when I was eating healthy, but not that healthy. And one of the things that was OK for me to eat was Cliff Bars. 
I don't know why, because because there was a picture of a mountain climber on it. Like, I, you know, but other members of my family ate Cliff Bars, too, but they would eat like two a week and we would get the boxes of them, 20 of them at Costco. And I would I would discover I'd eaten like, like there were days I would eat six of them, seven like that. was Like it was just there. And it was clearly a habit, if not an addiction. And the way I worked on it was like, I don't want to deprive my family of cliff bars. I'm not going to hide it somewhere. I just I decided one day that they are not food. And like the first few, I would reach for it. Oh, nope, don't do that. You know, and, and as, as I brought mindfulness to it, it reached the point where they could be around. They could be, you know, other people could be eating them. And so I haven't changed my environment, but I also haven't I'm not using my conscious mind to make decisions anymore. Where do, where does that fit in this kind of just I'm changing an identity, either an identity out in the world or an identity in myself and just cutting off that habit from possibility? Well, again, I don't know the exact circumstances in which you did mm -hmm. it. It sounds like you exerted self-control. And you are able to exert self-control until you had formed a habit to eat other things or um, a habit to um, to avoid the cliff bars. I don't know what mm. you were doing at the time, mm. but your description makes it sound like you didn't love the cliff bars and you were aware that you didn't. This wasn't something you were craving. You were eating them just sort of because they were there. They were there. So, they were sugary. They were much easier than like making food. And and it seems like they are food, although they're not. Right. I mean, they're sort of marketed as if they were food. Um, you exert you ex successfully exerted your decision making. And we're able to control that particular behavior. So congratulations. <laughs> the challenge is that most people aren't able to unless they set up contacts that help them. Uh -huh. and, and the interesting thing, the reason I included the, um, the story about my car is that I actually found those sensor beepings really irritating to begin with, mm -hmm. and they bothered me. I thought about them all the time. But after a while, they just sort of receded. You know, you habituate to things like that. And I didn't even notice when the rental car I hired didn't have them. Uh -huh. So, but my behavior did. And... That's when I backed into the wall because <laughs> my behavior was waiting for those sensor beeps and they weren't there. Right. And so I had an accident. And, and we can all set up our environments like that so that we're not noticing what it is that is helping us make the decisions we want to. Mm. But they're there. Right. But still, like I, I rented a car a month ago, two months ago, and it had some, a feature I'd never seen before. It would actually if you go on cruise control, it would actually slow down if you got too close to the car in front of you. Oh, wow. And okay. I was terrified of that because after driving it for three days, I'm like, I'm good now. Like when I came back to my car that didn't have it, I was seriously worried that I had developed this new because it didn't take long. Like, mm -hmm. like, I don't have to think anymore. I don't have to hit the brakes. It'll just slow down and speed up. And I've seen like studies of, uh, of piloting and th so when things go on autopilot. So I am, I'm, I'm just a little concerned that when we make too many things habitual to support good habits and those are fragile in our environments, that we're not, you know, it's, it's like I want to carpet the world instead of wearing shoes. Well, I'm afraid that in the case of health and eating and exercise, we are highly dependent on our environments. And you're right to be um, very cautious about temporary changes like that mm. um, and, and be very aware of going back to your original, I wish I had been so aware with my car um, and my rental car. 
But for so many of our experiences in daily life, these are kind of uniform. There's fast food on pretty much every corner you go to. Mm -hmm. And there's people eating everywhere. And so the idea is not to learn a strategy that, or set up an environment that's sort of a bubble. The idea is to set up as much of what you can control and you won't be able to control it all, but to set up as much as you can control to encourage the behaviors that you want mm. and discourage the ones that you don't want. Gotcha. And I guess though, for a lot of people, they say like their their eating gets messed up when they travel. But sure. If, but if they're you know if they're if they're traveling four times a year, then maybe that's okay to um, to use conscious control. Like it's you know okay, I'm in an airport. Exactly. I, don't, I don't know. Let me think. As opposed to. Or I habitually go to Smoothie King or I habitually go to uh, Arby's. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh -huh. if, there, if it's short amounts of time, conscious control will work. <laughs> Longer time, the environment's going to win out over you. <laughs> gotcha. That's <laughs> just the way it works. The last thing I want to ask you about is you have the chapter what it's called. You are you are not alone um, mm. that I love because I come out of public health. And this, you know, so much about habits and the, and the popular discussion of habits is so individual and can be inflected to blame the victim. And you talk about like, you know, Thaler and Kat and Sunstein's nudges to try to get people to do certain things. But when we look at society, like if there's this giant nudge to get us to overconsume practically everything. Mm -hmm. um, to get yeah. us to overconsume, overpurchase, um, underplan, to distract ourselves from the things that are really important to us. I'm sure you have the same experience that I do. Um, I go out to restaurants and you see a family sitting at dinner at a restaurant, which should be a kind of a opportunity for a family to get together and have a positive experience and all four are on their cell phones and it just is that always makes me sad because mm -hmm. um i it's it's such a missed missed opportunity to share and and yes i think ultimately because the context is so important because so many of us are struggling with it, right? Sixty percent overweight or obese. Hardly anyone has saved enough for retirement. We have all of these challenges that are shared by all of us, and that comes from living in this environment. So ultimately, all of us need the same kind of help, and that's probably not going to be completely individual help. It's going to be yeah. policy based, as yeah. you say. Yeah, because when you talk about, you know, these these defaults, these equilibria, <clears throat> there's a book by a um, computer scientist, uh, I think Eliezer Yudkowsky called inadequate equilibria and talking about like it's here and nobody can change it by themselves. So he uses like Craigslist as an example where there's so much scamming says, what if we had Dan's list and Dan's list was exactly like Craigslist, but you had verified profiles like why wouldn't everybody? But if somebody builds Dan's list, no one's going to go to it because everybody's on Craigslist. And, and so what it and what it would take is something kind of collective and global to get everyone to move to a, to a higher, more functional, happier equilibrium. And that's what you're talking about with 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 policy. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. it is. And when when you see shared problems, sometimes shared solutions are, are the are the, yeah. the most effective. So yeah. I got, so I got to ask you this: If you were, I don't know, to name the the public office of your choice, whether Surgeon General or head of education, or he, like as as a behavioral scientist, what are a couple of policies that if you had fiat power? do you think would make the biggest positive difference in the in the life of the nation? 
Well, I think that the obesity crisis is causing an awful lot of stress for individuals and for our health system. So that's one that actually would be very tractable. We know how to solve that on a societal level because as I said, we did it with smoking. Mm. So we could use the same techniques to help people reorient their diet in a healthier way. These aren't always popular. <laughs> well, I'm just I'm but, just imagining the cheeseburger section of the restaurant. <laughs> but but the idea is not to ban them. It's just to make them less accessible and to make other options more accessible. So people still have choices. Just as with smoking, we didn't take smoking, we didn't take cigarettes off the market, mm. which was an option, but we didn't. Instead, we just made it a little bit more difficult for people to smoke at the levels they were. Mm -hmm. And that certainly, if eating that cheeseburger is really important to you, then you will pay the money for it, including mm -hmm. the costs that it levies on our health system. And you would um, find a way to, to get it and um, have it for lunch. It wouldn't be impossible. So there's many ways to help people make the right decisions instead of just organizing public mm. policy in terms of what makes the most money. Right. What I love about your response is that it's not sort of heavy handed interference. It's actually removing artificial props to the food. Right. Like so this is called the cheeseburger. First of all, if, it, if, if we just took into account the cost of the environment and, the, and took away farm subsidies, it would already be fifty dollars instead of five. And then when you tack on the cost of like this is just <clears throat> we're just giving people a cleaner path to consequences. Exactly. Yes, we are in. That's a great way to put it is that we're making the consequences part of the experience. And so we're mm. factoring them into the economy mm. and doing that for the environment is the other is, is clearly the other thing that we need to be doing mm. <laughs> is starting to consider the um, externalities of all of these things that we take for granted. All right. Yeah. Well, I will vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Oh, this is this has been lovely. You've asked great questions. Well, thanks. Very thoughtful. I, thanks. I really appreciate um, the, the book called Good Habits, Bad Habits. I appreciate the, all the different studies that you put in, um, you know, of, of, from college students to epidemiology to to natural experiments um, and, and, you know, your, your commitment to like, what's the truth here? So well, this is um, very, you know, I feel like the truth is always empowering. So I really exactly. thank you for writing the book and for your time. And do you have a place for people to go online if they want to get more and follow your work? Yes. Um, as a researcher, I have my own research website. But probably what people would be most interested in is goodhabitsbadhabits.com, which is a website about the book and where they can learn more about how much they know about habits. Great, great. And I want to say, the, you know, the book does contain you know, we've, we've we've spoken because I'm I'm interested in the, the heady parts of this, but it does contain like specific suggestions, examples about how to develop good habits, how to break bad ones, how to use these disruptive moments, how to use context. So it's it's a cookbook as well as a philosophy of eating. <laughs> yes. Yep, I tried yeah. to make it very practical. So hopefully yeah. people will find it useful. Yep, definitely go go get the book. So uh, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Wendy Woods, so much for your work and for taking the time today. Oh, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye.